Hi class, welcome to the next section, chapter 4.8. Today we're going to talk about hyperbolic functions. So we're going to go completely over these functions, which means we're going to cover their functions, the functions, their inverses, and their derivatives of both the functions and their inverses, um, and then actually use them as well. So this is going to be a pretty long video, I'm suspecting. Um, we have one more section after this, but there's no video for it. So in my course reader that I created for this uh, I have the list of derivatives I believe there's something like to be honest like 36 so I don't know how much we're up to at this point but we're going to introduce some new derivatives in this section as well obviously um, and so all of the derivatives that we have are in my chapter 4.9 which is not going to have a video because it's just a list of derivatives but if you go and you look at the course reader I have the list of all the derivatives um, for my 4.9 section there's no examples or anything else in there it's just the list of it's just a reference page really so let's go ahead and talk about these hyperbolic functions um, hopefully you're somewhat familiar with conic sections if not it's okay because we don't talk about these functions right now in terms of uh, conic sections but it's nice to have some sort of uh, reference to relate to a hyperbolic, a hyperbolic function is very similar to a trig function, almost identical, really. So the way that um, that the trig functions are related to a circle are pretty much the way that the hyperbolic functions are related um, to hyperbolas. Okay. So again, the hyperbola. So the functions are related to a hyperbola the same way that a trig function is related to a circle. So all of our hyperbolic functions have an analogous trig function, or they're analogous to a trig function, I should say. So for instance, in trig, with the unit circle and triangle, we have a sine function, right? So in terms of hyperbolas, we still have a sine function, but we call it hyperbolic sine. Um, we actually don't call it hyperbolic sine, but that is the technical name for it. Um, we call it cinch. Okay, just like pinch, but cinch, or like you're cinching something together. Okay, we have an analogous function for cosine as well, which we call cosh. Okay, and we have a tanch, and so forth and so forth and so forth, which we will talk about in depth here. Okay, so let's talk about our hyperbolic functions. So we'll just go ahead and give the definition of the sine of the cinch function. It is e to the x minus e to the negative x divided by 2. There is an equivalent way to look at this function, which will be helpful, which is you, you can think about this e to the x minus e to the negative x times negative 2. So you can just think, or I'm sorry, times a 1 half. So you can just think of a 1 half being distributed, but typically you'll see it written like this. Um, I typically like to write the 1 half version, so you'll see me go back and forth between these. Um, so I don't want you to freak out when I say, hey, this is cinch, and you're like, oh, that doesn't look like what you talked about earlier. You have to be able to recognize that there's really just a distributed one half across e to the x and this negative um, e to the negative x. Same thing for cosh. Cosh is the same thing. It's, it has a one half distributed across the uh, exponential functions. Um, the only difference between cinch and cosh is that the sign is different. Okay, um, and we'll talk about not why, but these things are really really closely related to your trig functions, in that your um, cosh and cinch are odd and even functions just like your sine and cosine are odd and even functions as well. Okay. Our tanch function is just like tangent. It is cinch over cosh just like tangent is sine over cosine. Okay. So again, this h at the end is how we signify that it is a hyperbolic function. Okay. But it's, it does not have the same shape, by the way, but it behaves um, as far as in an identity the same way that the trig functions do. So that's part of the reason for it. Our cosecant is 1 over cinch, just like cosecant is 1 over sine. So cosecant is 1 over cinch. Okay, secant is 1 over cosh, just like secant is 1 over cosine. And this is always hard for me. Koth, I guess. Koch is uh, cosh over cinch. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the graph of just the first two, cinch and cosh. Uh, 
So notice again that for we have one half e to the x, okay? So if we think about this as adding two functions together, right? Or subtracting two functions, it's a one half e to the x for both of these first, right? e to the x, e to the x times one half. And we also have um, y equals negative one half e to the x. So if I were to, let's come back one more time, subtract these from another, that basically just turns this into, um, well, I'm subtracting their values. Well, if I have a positive and I have a negative, I'm actually adding them, right? Because one half plus the negative will give me uh, this form here. So I have my one half, I have my negative, and if I add their outputs together, so here if I add this value to this value, it's overall negative. It just moves up a little bit, right? If I add this value to the um, negative one half value that's below it, I'll just take this value and it'll just move down a little bit, right? Here is evenly spaced between zero, so when I add these two together, um, the positive and the negative cancel and I'll just get zero, right? So my cinch looks like this. It's kind of asymptotic to the one half in the long run behavior and it's asymptotic to the negative one half for its long run behavior, right? So here you see that it cancels out. So it looks almost like, almost like a cubic function, um, but not, not so much. It grows faster than a cubic because it's an exponential function, right? Now, if I have the same one half e to the x, but I use the positive form of one half e to the x. So again, this is just um, me taking e to the negative x, so it's decreasing in value, cutting everything in half. And then I add these together because that's what happens for cosh, right? Instead of taking the negative form, I'm taking the positive form, add them together. Okay, so instead of being here at one half, which is a shared point for both of these, it'll be at one. If I take this value here and I add this small value, it's just a little bit over, right? If I take this large value and this little value, I'll just be a little bit over when I add these two functions together. So my cosh function is very similar to a parabola, okay? It's not exactly a parabola, but it's parabolic in nature. So now we can come and we can, now that we have these identities, I'm sorry, these uh, functions, okay, my cinch, cosh, tanch, cosecanch, secanch, and coth, and we understand how they're formed, which is again, very, very similar to how we form our trig functions. We can now talk about the identities that we can form from here. And the identities that we can form with the hyperbolic functions are really the same identities that we have for the others, right? My cinch function is, um, odd, just like sine is an odd function, okay? My cosh function is even, just like a cosine function is even. Cosh squared minus cinch squared equals one. So we know for cosine and sine, when I square both terms and add them, I get the Pyth Pythagorean identity that equals one. Here, we subtract the two, and then it will be cosh first and cinch second when we subtract them, okay? You can remember this because we know that cosine generally goes for x and sine generally goes with y. So it kind of goes in order of that, right? x and then y. I do not want you to think that cosh is an x value and cinch is a y value because it does not work that way. Okay, that's not, these aren't trig functions. They just kind of behave somewhat like them. Similar, but small differences. The next, next hyperbolic identity we have, which would come straight from this uh, identity of number three, is one minus tanch squared equals secanch squared. Okay, then here we just have a quick, um, two quick uh, addition formulas, okay? Addition or subtraction formulas really. Cinch of x plus y is cinch of x cosh of y plus cosh of x cinch of y. And then we have our addition formula for cosh as well, okay? So five and six you don't normally use too often. I've actually probably never used these. Uh, but it's good to know that the identities are kind of formed in the same way. So now let's talk about the derivatives, okay? So we've talked about our functions. We've talked about some of the identities. We looked at two of the graphs. For instance, now that I know what the graph of cinch and cosh looks like, if I wanted to find the graph of tanch, I could using these graphs of cinch and cosh. But again, it's not super necessary. 
a lot of times we're really just using like the cost graph is the one we use the most. Um, so the derivative of cinch. Okay, so again, these are similar to our um, trig functions. If I want to find the derivative of cinch, remember what cinch is. Okay, cinch is one half e to the x minus one half e to the negative x. So think about what happens if I take this derivative. One half e to the x is still just one half e to the x. The derivative of negative one half e to the negative x turns into positive one half e to the negative x. So the derivative of cinch is, that's right, it's just going to be cosh. Okay, so if I take this derivative, I will just get out my cosh function. Okay, so I can do that without even having to look at it, you know, having to go through the formulas. Because we know what the formulas are, they're exponential in, in form. So if we have to actually calculate any of these, just use the formulas that we have, right? Yeah. So the derivative of cosh is going to be cinch. These do not change sign. They just alternate back and forth between cosine and sine, cosine and sine, cosine and sine. But instead of cosine and sine, it's cosh and cinch, cosh and cinch, cosh and cinch, right? Without changing or alternating signs. The derivative of tanch. Again, if I really, really want to like derive the formula, I'll go to tanch. I will plug in the cinch. I'll plug in the cosh. I would simplify it and then I would take its derivative. Um, you could do that on your own if you wish, or maybe I ask you to do that for a classwork problem, or perhaps we even go over that as one of our example problems later on. Um, but you could figure that out on your own if you wanted to, but I'm going to go ahead and just give you the formula. So the derivative of tanch is secant squared, which should be pretty familiar to you, right? The derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant cough right, which is similar to what we had before as well. The derivative of secant is negative secant times tanch, and the derivative of cough is negative cosecant squared. So again, those derivatives are very, very similar, if not identical, but just hyperbolic um, to those of the trig formulas. Now, again, the, they're similar in form because they, you know, these hyperbolic functions behave like trig formulas. But don't take that for granted. Don't just say, oh, they're pretty much a trig function. So I'll just do, you know, if I have a problem with one of these, I'll just do stuff in trig and then add an H at the end. It doesn't work like that. Okay. It will for the derivative. But if you notice, like, for instance, our hyperbolic identities, there is a difference for some of these. So you want to make sure that you're using these functions and not using trig functions and then just coming to some conclusion and then throwing an H at the end of everything because you'll probably get something wrong. Okay. So let's talk about the inverse hyperbolic functions. So not the derivatives, not the inverse of the derivatives, but the inverses of these functions, right? So cinch inverse and cosh inverse. So remember the inverse of these functions, these are exponential functions, right? They're not, they are ratios, but they're not ratios like the trig functions are. They're, with the trig functions, there's not really like a formula that we can use to find the inverse. We just have to understand how inverses work for the trig ones. Here, if I take an inverse, I can actually do something because we know that exponentials have an inverse form of a logarithm, right? In this case, a natural logarithm. So when I'm doing these, there's actual math that goes behind me finding these values, okay? So for instance, for cinch inverse, I will get natural log of x plus square root of x squared plus 1. Later on, we will go through and we will derive some of these um, inverse functions. But if I took the cinch formula, 1 half e to the x minus 1 half e to the negative x, and I wanted to take its inverse, I could do so by taking the log form of that equation. And that will give me this form here. You can double check that now and make sure you come up with the same thing. Okay, here x has to be a real number. For cosh inverse, <clears throat> it's natural log of x plus x squared minus 1, right? Because remember, there's a difference in sign between cinch and cosh. So it should make sense that their derivatives are, I'm sorry, that their inverses are almost identical, but with a sign change or two somewhere in here. It, in this case, there's only one sign change. Here for cosh, we have to have x be larger than 1. <clears throat> 
Here, x can be any number because for the things that go inside, they get squared. So even if I use a negative number, it doesn't affect it. And for the second one, it doesn't matter what you plug in because we can't have it be uh, less than one after we square it. Otherwise, we get a negative number on the inside, which is not okay for natural logs. Okay. So for tanch, again, if I wanted to figure this out, I would simplify the standard tanch formula, then take its inverse. But that's going to come out to one half natural log of one plus x over one minus x. Okay. Here, the restriction is that we have to be um, in between negative one and one. We cannot be the value one or negative one because if I plug in one, I'm undefined in the denominator. If I plug in negative one, then I'm zero in the numerator, which is not allowed in the natural log in the uh, natural log function or any log function. So these are the inverse hyperbolic functions. If I ever have to use like cotanch inverse or secanch inverse, I would just apply this, right? So we would just uh, manipulate it to look like this and move things around as necessary, okay? So derivatives of these inverse hyperbolic functions. So taking these inverse, if I need to take the derivative of cinch inverse, it's not as hard as it looks because it's not necessarily that I'm trying to figure out this side. I'm just going to take the derivative of the right hand side, right? I have actual formulas for the right hand side, not like with the sine and cosine functions where I don't have a closed form form for uh, sine inverse, cosine inverse, tan inverse, and things like that. And we had to be a little bit crafty and use that inverse formula for the derivative, the, the derivative of the inverse formula. Here, the derivative of cinch, I'm just taking the derivative of this function, right? So the derivative of cinch is going to simplify to 1 over square root 1 plus x squared. If you're not sure or don't believe me, then take this derivative yourself, right? You'll have 1 over uh, this function times the derivative of this function. And when you simplify it, you should simplify it down to this form. The derivative of Cauch inverse, same thing. I'm taking the derivative of natural log x plus square root x squared minus 1. We know it should come out to be pretty much the same thing, but a difference in sign. So we have 1 over square root x squared minus 1. Okay, so for my derivative of tanch inverse, same thing. I'm going to take the derivative of this 1 half. Uh, natural log of 1 plus x divided by 1 minus x <clears throat> and that will come out to 1 minus x squared. Here we have a restriction on the domain however that x cannot be uh, more than 1, 1 or larger. It has to be in between 0 and 1, okay? Uh, or I guess between negative 1 and 1, okay? Absolute value wise it has to be uh, less than 1. So in between negative 1 and 1 not including those bounds, is the restriction on the domain of this function. So then for uh, cosecant inverse, if I wanted to figure this out, I would, I could transform my cinch function so that it's cosecant inverse and then take its derivative, uh, but that should come out to the negative of 1 over absolute value, square root x squared plus 1, the derivative of secant inverse, is very similar, but notice that there is a difference in the uh, square root and that the value here can take on negative values. Here it has to be absolute value. Okay. And the derivative of cos inverse is 1 over 1 minus x squared with a, a domain restriction of being larger than 1. So from 1 to infinity, I'm sorry, not including 1, but 1 to infinity, not including 1, or from negative 1 to negative infinity, or I guess the other way around, negative infinity to negative one, but not including negative one, okay? So again here, notice that the derivatives for number three and number six uh, are pretty much identical, but their domains don't share any values, okay? For both of these, we're not allowed obviously to be one because then we're undefined in the denominator, um, or we're zero in the denominator making our values undefined, but here we're looking at values that are um, Absolute value wise less than one, so between negative one and one, and here anything outside of those values. So now let's do some examples. So we're gonna derive some of these things, we're gonna do some of the derivatives, we're just gonna kind of pick and choose through these um, discussions and these formulas that we have for what we wanna derive. Okay, so these ones I think are fairly similar to find. 
they're just derivatives of uh, one half e to the x and uh, one half e to the negative x in some form, right? Either you have to do some math first and then take the derivative or just take that derivative. But the these ones are rather straightforward. So uh, we might skip past or do one of these really quickly. Uh, looking at these inverse signs might be worthwhile um, or might be worth it for you to do it on your own. And for these ones, we'll definitely go over one or two of these uh, inverse hyperbolic derivatives. Okay. So <clears throat> let's look at a limit first. Okay. Because this is a trig, or I'm sorry, a calc one class. We have not looked at the limit of any of these functions. So this will be nice because if I look at the limit of just secant, I don't know. I have no idea what secant looks like. But I do know that secant is the same over 1 over cosh, right? Um, but this might not be super helpful for me either because I don't really know what cosh looks like. I know I do have a graph for this, um, but I don't know what 1 over cosh looks like as a graph. So instead of just trying to figure out what this is or saying, oh, well, cosine does this in infinity, that won't help me because cosine and cosh are two different functions. So I'm going to turn this into its exponential form, right? I'll just write the exponential form of cosh, which is 1 over 1 half e to the x plus 1 half e to the negative x. And then I'm going to simplify. So I have a fraction and a fraction. So really what I get to do is just move this 2 to the numerator and rewrite it in this form, right? So I'm really kind of just uh, multiplying by the reciprocal here. And so now I can just look at what's going to happen here. Well, e to the x, what does that do as it goes to infinity? e to the x just continues to get larger and larger and larger. e to the negative x, well, that's a decreasing exponential function. So in very large values, this goes to 0. So really, when I'm looking at very large values, if I'm just kind of shooting off, like, what does this look like for very large values? It looks like 2 over infinity plus 0 right? Because this is basically going to go to zero. This is basically going to go into infinity. Now, this is bad notation. Really, what we should do is, you know, take the limit of the numerator and the limit of the denominator and look at each piece. But that's pretty much what we did informally here, right? Well, zero doesn't add anything to us. Two over a very large value is actually a very small value. So overall, the limit of secant as x goes to infinity is going to be zero. It's going to go to zero. So we've looked at our hyperbolic functions, okay? We've looked at the different functions we have. We've looked at a few of the graphs, two graphs. We looked at some identities. We looked at the derivatives of the hyperbolic functions. We looked at the inverse functions. And then we looked at the derivatives of the inverse functions. And then now we've looked at a limit of one of those uh, functions. So we should be able to look at the limit of any of those functions because we just kind of apply the same type of principles as we did here. So again, if you ever get stuck for your hyperbolic functions, just turn it into its exponential form and work with it that way. That's really an easy approach. Not an easy approach, but a you know an approach that will get you somewhere. So now we want to find the derivative of a function that includes a natural log and a tanch. Okay. So really, we're just focused on this tanch. But here, we're going to have to use a um, product rule. And here, we'll just use the chain rule, right? So we're going to find the derivative of y equals x tanch inverse. Just to remember what the derivative of the inverse tanch is, it's 1 over 1 minus x squared. OK. So. To take this derivative, it'll be 1 times tanch inverse of x, or just tanch inverse of x, plus x times 1 over 1 minus x squared. And we will add to that 1 over square root 1 minus x squared times the derivative of this, which is the chain rule again. So we'll have 1 half 1 minus x squared to the negative 1 half, and multiply that times negative 2x. Okay, so we've got to use the chain rule three times for this natural log derivative. And then now, again, as you know, you guys know me, I don't like keeping things in this form. Let's go ahead and simplify as much as possible. So remember, for tanch inverse, we also have a closed form as well. 
Okay, so instead of keeping it as tangent inverse, we can, or we can simplify it into this form, depending on what's more useful at the time. Okay, so let's go ahead and work with our problem from where we're at. So we found this derivative. Okay, we'll keep the tangent here for now. We'll apply this x to the numerator, and then we'll simplify this through. So this negative 2 and this 1 half basically cancel. And that will give us a negative, but here it looks like I did not cancel. I kept the 2, and I kept the 2 in the numerator. So eventually we will cancel these two out. Um, I went ahead and I was nice, and I decided to use the notation that most of you guys use. Um, so I have square root of 1 minus x squared in the denominator, and this 1 minus x squared also moves to the denominator. So the real reason I did this, because normally I never do, it's because I already have it written from the form from when I needed to do the derivative. So it's nice because it's the same thing, which means it really just cancels the square root. So I might not have seen that if I didn't write it in this negative form, but I would have seen it if I took it from its denominator form here and wrote it as a negative exponent. So either way, I would have had to change one or the other, and I would have seen that. I could combine them together and add their powers because they got the same base basically. So here I decided to keep it as a denominator type of function. Some of you guys really like to do this and you don't like these negative exponents. So I kept it in this form. So we'll simplify this and we'll cancel these twos. Okay. Boom. How nice, right? Now I have x over 1 minus x squared minus the same thing. So those things are going to cancel out. And I'm left with tanch inverse. So this whole derivative here is really just tanch inverse. At this point, the name of the function tanch inverse of x is the best way to go. I would not want to put in this one half natural log, yada, 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 yada. If I needed to do some math on this now, yeah, maybe I would. Okay. But tanch inverse for now, that's, that's a much nicer, cleaner answer. So we're all about keeping things um, in a nice compact form. And so this is a, a wonderful answer here. Okay. Let's go ahead and go over the next example. <clears throat> so we want to verify the derivative of cosecant inverse. So what that means is um, let's go ahead and derive this formula. So <clears throat> we actually kind of have, not kind of, we have two ways of doing that. Okay. First is by calculating the derivative directly, which is, um, using the inverse, uh, the definition of the derivative of the inverse. And we can calculate it by trying to turn it into a cinch first and then taking its derivative. Okay, So for this calculating it uh, directly, we're going to do that by just looking at cosecant uh, inverse, not turning it into um, some sort of uh, natural log form, but by just looking at it and taking its derivative. So we're going to use the derivative, the definition that the derivative of an inverse function is 1 over the derivative of the function with the inverse being plugged in. So we did this when we talked about the sine inverse functions taking their derivatives. So remember what we have to do here. We have to find a relationship between the inverse function and its original function, right? So we know that the derivative of um, cosecant is, I'm not, sorry, not the derivative, that the inverse of cosecant is cosecant. So I need to find a relationship, some sort of uh, identity that has cosecant in it. So if we come back to our identities, okay, identities, these were the six identities that we had. I actually left out a few on purpose. Um, these ones, this, the addition formulas, addition subtraction formulas, those are pretty much useless. We will never use those. <clears throat> one and two are not going to help me for what I need, right? They have nothing to do with um, cosecant. There's no relationship between it and any other function. Um, here we have the cosh squared minus cinch squared, which if you remember from your trig for the Pythagorean identity with cosecant, I'm sorry, with cosine squared plus sine squared equals one, you use that to develop uh, the other two trig identities. So here we only gave you one of those trig identities, which is the 1 minus tanch squared equals secant squared. And so we would have found this by dividing everything by cosh squared, right? 
cos squared divided by cos squared is 1. Cinch squared divided by tan squared, I'm sorry, be, cinch squared divided by cos squared is tan. And then 1 over secant squared would be, um, by cos squared would be secant squared. So we didn't show the other one, which is what if I took this and divide everything by cinch? So we're going to go ahead and do that because that will give us a relationship between co between cos squared and some other formula, most likely cosecant squared, right? So we're going to use the other um, identity there in order to figure out a relationship. And so remember, once we find this relationship, we will plug cos cosecant inverse into its derivative function wherever necessary um, from the relationship that we form using this so that we can have everything in terms of x instead of a bunch of hyperbolic trig functions, right? So if you're kind of fuzzy on what these steps are, just go back and review the inverse trig functions, um, the derivative of those functions real quick uh, so that you're familiar with the process that we're about to do, okay? So let's go ahead and divide everything by this cinch squared. So this will turn into 1. This will turn into 1 over cinch squared, which is going to be cosecant squared. This will be cos squared, right? So this turn gives me that third identity that I did not provide you before, which is cos squared minus 1 is cosecant squared. If I solve this for not for the cos squared, um, but for the cos squared, that's what I want. I want to isolate the non uh, function okay the the function that's not the inverse is the one that I want to isolate so this is not the inverse of this this one is so this is the one I want to isolate so I'm gonna add one of both sides and then take the square root okay so my cough function is this function so now when I take the derivative of cosecant um, inverse I will have 1 over the derivative. So let's just look at what the derivative of its original function, right? So into the original function, I'm plugging in my inverse function. So the derivative of the original function, cosecant, is here. Okay. Oops, not here. Not yet. This, negative cosecant and cos, which is important because I just found cos, right? So when I plug in cosecant inverse into this, right? The derivative of cosecant. This one is already taken care of. Cos, I now have a form of which is based solely upon cosecant. So that my derivative is made only of uh, the function that I have the inverse for. Okay. All right. So Remember the derivative of cosecant, right? F prime is negative cosecant of x times cot of x. And I'm plugging into that derivative my inverse function. So I have cosecant, um, cosecant inverse, and I have cot, and into that I'm plugging in cosecant inverse. Now here, this first one, it's fine because they'll cancel each other out. Here, however, cot and cosecant, they don't cancel each other out. So that's why I have cos written in terms of cosecant. So I'm going to, first I'll just write this as x. Okay, it'll be absolute value of x. Here, I will replace my cos with its cosecant function. So into my cosecant squared function, I'm plugging in the inverse, which will give me x squared, which gives me the uh, derivative of cosecant inverse. So again, just to verify. Right, cosecant inverse was negative 1 over absolute value square root x squared plus 1. All right. So let's go through our second method. Okay, so our second method is by taking um, cosecant, running in terms of cinch, and then finding the inverse and then taking its derivative, okay? So cosecant, we know we can rewrite as one over cinch. Um, probably want to replace that with the exponential form of a um, cinch, which is the following. 
And if I simplify this, I really just get to bring this two on top, which is nice. And then from here, I would want to find the inverse, which is nice because I know we're going back and forth a lot. But when we came back to these inverse hyperbolic functions, I didn't show you how we found these inverses at all. I just kind of talked us through it. So we've talked about uh, finding derivatives for these hyperbolic functions and the easiest way to do so. We've looked at limits of these things. Um, we verified an inverse function derivative, but we haven't talked about just finding inverse in general for one of these hyperbolic functions. So with this example, we're going to pretty much cover all of our bases um, by doing at least like one thing of everything, right, that is being presented today. So if I want to find the inverse for this, remember what we do. I first set this equal to y, and then I swap out my x's and my y's, right? So if I do that all at once, I'll just set it equal to x, and then my x's will become y. So at this point, you should be familiar with uh, inverse functions, especially since we had an entire section in chapter 1 based on it. So I'm just skipping one step here. Instead of saying y equals this and then swapping the variables, I'm just swapping the variables right away. Okay. So my goal, again, is to solve for y. So I can do this a couple of ways. I can rewrite this as 1 over... Um, e to the y here and then try to move some stuff around um, but really what I want to do first is I just want to get these e to the y's out of being in a negative position okay I would like to have them in a top position although it doesn't really matter I could just take the natural log of both sides as it is okay to be honest I don't remember what I do but okay that makes more sense that's more likely something that I would generally do um, and then from here I probably um, divide both sides by x. Oh no, I set up an equation, so I moved over my 2. Okay, And then I bumped everything up by multiplying it by e to the y. Okay, So you might say, well, why do that? right? And so the reason is because now I don't have any negative y's. Right? Now it's e to the 2y, it's e to the y, and now I have something that has no y's at all. So I could really look at this as kind of a polynomial if I wanted to make a substitution, right? Which is kind of what I'm doing. So if I say let u be e to the y, now it kind of is polynomial in form. And so I could solve for e to the y, right? Because it looks like a quadratic. So trying to solve for y, where I'm not thinking of x as a variable at this point. I'm thinking about it as a constant, right? So I'm just solving for e to the y so that I can take the natural log of both sides, right? So I make it quadratic in form, and I'm basically kind of doing like a u substitution. So it looks like x times u squared minus 2 to the u minus x, where I'm considering x as, again, not a variable, but a constant. So that lets me put e to the y, um, solve for it in terms of a quadratic, right? Because it looks like a quadratic. So negative 2 is my b minus b squared uh, b squared minus 4ac right so I got my 4 I got my a and I got my c divided by 2a right so if I start to simplify I have a 4 minus I'm sorry plus 4x squared so I have a common 4 so I can pull that out as uh, square root of 4 on the outside or 2. So now everything has a multiple of 2 so I can cancel out a 2 and I have 1 plus or minus square root of 1 minus x squared over x. Okay. And so from here now I have e to the y equals this thing. So I can take the uh, natural log of both sides which will cancel out this e and give me y. And now I have natural log. I actually have two answers, right? The plus form and the minus form. So I kind of have to look at both of those, right? But this is the general form now for cosecant inverse. Okay. So we will restrict this to the positive case. So we don't have to worry about the negative case if I wanted to. I could look at the negative case, but this absolute value of x here will allow me to keep it positive right so that was that's one of the reasons why i use absolute value because if i did have negative here then yeah this will be a negative um 
and then this would turn back into a positive. So we'll just use absolute value here in order to keep it positive and just use a single form. So my cosecant is the following. You can keep this absolute value sign or you can just restrict your x values. It doesn't really matter. Um, so either way is okay. So we can use this value. So now when I take the derivative of this, I will take the derivative of its closed form. Okay, so the derivative of cosecant inverse is, okay, again, this is natural log, so it'll be 1 over this thing, just to make sure you have it, 1 uh, plus or minus square root 1 plus x squared. If I'm using the regular form, if I want to, I can use just a positive case and restrict this to absolute value of x. Here, we're just going to kind of go for it and just use what we have. So it'll be 1 over that thing times the derivative of this. So that means I have to use the uh, quotient rule. So 1 goes away to 0. Um, this will turn into 1 half times 1 plus x squared on the inside times negative 1 half times 2x from the chain rule. And I'll multiply it times x. I won't do anything to the x. And I will subtract from that this numerator function being left alone, okay, and then the derivative of x, which is just 1, and then I'll square x, okay. So I need to just finish simplifying at this point, right. I found the derivatives. Here I'll go ahead and flip this around so it's x over 1 plus or minus square root 1 plus x squared, right, so it's nice and easy. Here um, I'm still considering the plus and minus form, so I'm kind of doing two things at a time as I go. Um, same here. If I ever have to multiply by a negative sign or pull out a negative sign, then this would flip to minus plus. So for instance, if I distribute this negative, it'll be minus one, and this will go from plus minus to minus plus, right? It's just saying that I'm switching signs because right now these two signs will agree, this first one and this last one. But if I distribute this, if this is plus, well, then this has to be negative, right? So you can use the plus minus and minus plus uh, when you do your calculations. So right now we're really just thinking about, to be honest, uh, two functions, right? Because we have the everything plus and everything minus for the plus minus cases. So for the second form, I haven't simplified anything yet. Um, I think the easiest thing to do is try to notice that I have this 1 plus x squared to the negative 1 half power. That's the same thing as this square root function. Um, so maybe I just try to divide everything by this value. Okay. So let's see here. From this line to this, the only thing that I did was I simplified this 2x with this 1 half. And I multiplied these two x's together. So I have x squared in front. So plus or minus x squared. 1 uh, plus x squared to the negative 1 half power. And then I have this thing going on over here as well. Okay. So if I distribute this across, just like I said before, the 1 turns negative. This plus minus turns into minus plus. I now have my uh, square root 1 plus x squared in front. So I just kind of move this to the front. And then I have my plus or minus x squared, 1 minus x squared to negative 1 half. So now I can pull out a common factor just for this 1 half. But first, let's rewrite this um, as a negative uh denominator here. So I'm just going to go ahead and throw this under. So I have this being divided by the x squared. Um, this negative one here, as you see, sort of disappears. And the reason being is because I'm multiplying it top and bottom, right? So if I divide the, I'm basically writing this whole numerator over a common denominator of square root one plus x squared. So this negative one, I had to write, I had to multiply top and bottom times square root one plus x squared. So that's why you see I have a negative square root one plus x squared. That's giving me the negative one right here. These two terms is the negative one. If I divide this by uh, square root one minus x squared, it's going to bump it up in power and turn it into a positive. Okay. So instead of pulling it out as a common factor from each of these terms, these three terms here, I decided to just make it a common denominator um, and have a fraction inside of a fraction. 
Okay, And so that's why here, this x squared is all alone because it itself is dividing this. So if you look at this as um, square root 1 plus x squared in the denominator, here, okay, these two will give me the negative one. These two, right, same base, different powers. You can think of this as one minus one half. That would give me the one half here, okay. This x squared, obviously, it itself right here is on the bottom. So now what this allows me to do, right, the reason I did this is because I'm trying to simplify as much as possible. So I can flip this around, okay. Multiply by the reciprocal of this, so this will actually give me an x in front of this term, right? So that's really what I did. So now I have a single fraction instead of a complex fraction. So now I'm going to just continue to simplify as much as I can, right? So um, now that everything is a little bit different with the denominator here, I could try to simplify a little bit more. Um, I can try to simplify my numerator and denominator. So here you see this minus plus that's here, I can distribute to each of these signs, which means that let's just say that I'm taking the top form, right? That would make this a negative, this would make this a negative, and this would stay positive, so it would cancel. And if I'm taking the bottom sign, this would be a positive one, this would still be a positive one, but this would be a negative x squared. So these two x squares, no matter what, are going to cancel because they're being added together, and they always will have opposite signs if I distribute this minus plus because this is a plus minus. So these two x squares disappear. So I should have negative square root 1 plus x squared minus plus 1. Okay. So here you see me, I distribute the sign first before I actually cancel. And then here I actually just canceled them. Okay. So notice now what's going on is that in this denominator, I have 1 plus or minus root 1 plus x squared. Here, I have a negative square root 1 plus x squared minus plus 1. It's pretty much the same thing if I pull out a negative sign, right? If I pull out the negative sign, this turns positive, okay? And this turns into plus minus. So it doesn't necessarily cancel all the way, but I can cancel them when they agree at certain points, right? So if I pull out the negative, Let's just think about this. So this will be positive, and this one will be positive. And if I distribute the negative, then it'll look like this again. Okay. So here you see me pulling out this negative sign. Okay. All right. And so these will basically cancel out. Okay. Especially if I restricted it to looking at only the positive case, and I get the same thing that I had before for cosecant. Okay. The derivative of a cosecant inverse was negative 1 over absolute value of x, uh, square root of x squared plus 1. And that's basically what I had here as well, okay, except the x squared and 1 were in different uh, positions. But again, if I look at the absolute value, if I keep this as absolute value, um, that's the way it works. So this is probably the first time you probably had to play with like plus and minuses this much, but it's important to know how to do that, right? So again, you're just looking at when are they the same. And what are the opposites? Okay, so that pretty much uh, wraps it up for chapter four for us. So at this point, we have all the derivatives that we'll ever need, all the methods for taking derivatives that we'll ever need. Um, and now for the remainder of this calculus one course, we will just focus on using these things to then analyze our functions, to do more advanced level mathematics and learn how to figure things out.